right, so we are in the week of September 28th through October 1st. So if you haven't done the case study and chapter six mastering quiz, you need to get those done. I moved the due date for exam two to Friday evening. Okay, so you've got kind of a window to get that done over chapters four through six. And we finished chapter six, so we're starting um, articulation. Okay, so hopefully my plan is to start muscle tissue next week. All right, so we'll get started with that. So we are in the week eight learning activities module. Since we're a little ahead. All right. We got the exam review for exam three. Okay, so you won't need that for this week, but just know that's where it is. All right, you got full notes, lecture presentations, and I have the one that I created. Here's the one with the blanks, so hopefully you printed that out so you can fill it in on your own. You have a YouTube playlist. Okay, so you have those videos, like, um, Wendy Riggs and uh, course uh, crash course, development science. Professor Dave explains links to the book. All right, uh, practice anatomy lab. So now that we're starting to get into models and things like that, you definitely want to be spending time in there looking at practice anatomy lab. You have an MP3 you can listen to on types of joints and their movements. Link to the glossary and flashcards and a practice test. All right, so. The uh, I haven't moved the dates on the dynamic study module, so we'll, we'll just keep those consistent for right now. But you can start working on them. So, so let's get into articulations. All right, so let's start with a couple of turns, some basic turns. You have Arthrology, the neurology study of, so this is the science concerned with the study of joints. Okay. So, so let's say articulations, fancy word for joint. You should say a place of interaction between two or more bones. Okay. So when you articulate, you're communicating, right? You're interacting. So this is bones interacting. So in your review for this chapter six, there, I think there are a few statements in here. So you got to fill in the blank at the end of the sentence. So you might have to do this on the test. So the characteristic structure of a joint determines the type of movement that can occur. Okay. So structure of the joint determines the type of movement. Important principle. Okay, another important principle, how are joints classified? Two main ways, okay, a lot more detail that we'll get into today, but basically you can classify joints by structure or function. So if you're going to classify joints based on structure, it's basic anatomical organization of that joint. Important principle is that whether or not you have a joint cavity helps you determine the classification as well as the kind of supporting tissue you have around that joint. All right, so four big structural categories. We have bony articulations, fibrous articulations, cartilaginous articulations, and synovial articulations. All right, so the bony joints or articulations, they lack a joint cavity. And you have two separate bones that get fused 
in that way because they're fused there's no boundary between the two example would be the atopic suture on your frontal bones as well as the epiphyseal lines of mature bones okay so those are bony articulations for fibrous articulations they also lack a joint cavity but they're made up of fibrous connective tissue that connects the articulating bones example where you see this is between the tibia and the fibula in your leg so the cartilaginous joints also lack a joint cavity you get cartilage that will bind to the articulating bones example here would be between the left and right halves of the pelvis also between the vertebrae you'll see these now for the synovial joints these are the only ones that do have a joint cavity and you have ligaments there and they help support those articulating bones example is your knee you have heard of acl mcl anterior cruciate ligament medial cruciate ligament okay these are ligaments in the knee joint so that's kind of an overview of structural classification. So before we move on to functional, why don't you discuss with your partner the two ways you can, big ways you can classify joints and also characteristics of, or different types of structural joints. You can do this at home as well. All right, so if we're going to classify articulations functionally based on how much movement you get in that joint. And then you can subdivide the functional categories based on structure and range of motion. All right, so big categories in the functional classification method are synarthroses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses. Okay. You know, and we'll get into more details on each of these. And then in the synarthroses, you have the sutures, you have a gonfosis, synchrondosis, and sinusosis, or sinatosis. And amphiarthroses, you have the syndesmosis and the symphysis. And the diathroses, you have joints you're probably somewhat familiar with, like the gliding joints or planar joints, hinge joints pivot joints, ellipsoid joints or condyloid joints, the saddle or solaris joints, and ball and socket joints. Okay. All right, a little more on the big categories here. So for this synarthroses, these are immovable. So you can't, they don't move. And that should make sense because they are considered extremely strong. And examples of the synthroses are sutures, so like the fusion of those bones in your skull. And the amphiarthroses, these are slightly movable. And so because of that, they're not as strong as the synarthrosis, but they permit less movement than you will find in a diathrosis, which we'll talk about next. They're somewhere in the middle. So you'll find these between the tibia and fibula. And between the left and right halves of the pelvis. Between the vertebrae. Now for the diathroses. These are freely movable. They're also synovial joints. And because they're synovial joints, their articular capsules of those joints align with synovial membranes. And we learned in lab, synovial 
membranes produce synovial fluid, which serves as a lubricant. <clears throat> Examples of diaphoroses are your elbow joint and your knee joint. And if you look at the colors, the colors should overlap with what we learn on the structural classification. Okay, so spend some time on that as well, but just different ways of describing. Okay, so there's four types of synaphoroses. You have the sutures, the confosis, the synchrondosis, and the sinatosis. The sutures are immovable, again, between the bones of the skull, and they're bound together by dense connective tissue. The gonfosis is also movable and binds your teeth to the bony sockets by what we call periodontal ligaments. Okay. So the gonfosis holds your teeth in place. So the synchrondosis is a rigid cartilaginous bridge. It's between uh, two bones. Example would be your epiphyseal plate, as well as the cartilaginous connections between your vertebral sternal ribs the ribs that touch your vertebrae in the sternum and the sternum. So between those ribs and the sternum. Sinatosis, these are two bones that are completely fused. Like your metopic suture in your frontal bone and your epiphyseal line in your mature bones. So the epiphyseal plates, synchrono synchrondosis, your epiphyseal lines, the sinatosis. Okay, you have six types of diathroses. You have your gliding joints. And they permit some movement, not very much. So it's generally in single plane, like side to side or back and forth. So the hinge joints, monoaxial, means they only move in one, along one axis, or at one axis, and it's angular movement, which we'll talk about later. Examples would be the elbow and the knee joints. So if you think about your elbow, you know, it moves kind of like the hinge on a door. So for pivot joints, these are also monoaxial, but they only permit rotation. Examples would be the atlas and the axis, okay, your first two cervical vertebrae. As well as the head of the radius and the shaft of the ulna. You have your ellipsoid or condyloid joints, and these are biaxial. They have an articular face that's shaped like an oval, and it nestles within a depression or hole or space in the opposing surface. So examples would be your phalanges with your metacarpals, okay, in the base of your hand. And 
your phalanges with your metatarsals, the bones in the base of your foot. So the saddle joints, if you're creative, you know, you can maybe look at them, they look a little bit like saddles. They're biaxial. The articular faces are concave on one axis and convex on the other axis. Example here would be the carpo metacarpal joint, the base of your thumb. So it's basically a joint here between the base of your thumb and well, actually, yeah, so the base of your thumb. So actually here, so with the wrist, in the base of your thumb, so right here. So this joint here would be a saddle joint, reaching the wrist and the base of your hand. So the ball and socket joint is formed based on having a round head on one bone and it rests inside a cup-shaped depression on the other bone. It's triaxial, means it can move in three planes. It can permit rotation and other movements. Example would be your shoulder joint and your hip joint. Okay, so let's take a break and discuss with your partner the functional classification of joints and what the different types of joints are that fit into each of those functional categories. Okay, so the articular cartilage. So this is a cartilage pad and it covers the surface of your bones inside the joint cavity. So it's basically covering the surface of the bone. And the matrix in the articular cartilage has more water than most other cartilages do. And the surfaces are smooth and slick. All right. So medical conditions that are related to articulations, you have rheumatism, which is inflammation. Okay, so you're getting redness, swelling, around these fibrous connective tissue that surrounds the joints. You get pain and stiffness, affects both your skeletal system and can also affect your muscular system. Lots of different kinds of rheumatism. You also have arthritis. Again, another form of inflammation. And these rheumatic diseases typically are gonna affect synovial joints. And then this, when it's arthritis, you're gonna get damage to the articular cartilage. And there's over 50 different kinds of arthritis. And again, anytime you see medical conditions, these make good matching questions, okay? Osteoarthritis, it's non-inflammatory, okay? So it's different from the others, okay? And it's characterized by deteriorating the articulated artic the articular cartilage and making new bone at the joint surfaces. So it's, it's basically moving the cartilage away and putting bone there. And that's really bad because cartilage helps to keep the bones from hitting each other. Okay, so if you have bone hitting bone, 
It's going to be painful. Rheumatoid arthritis. In this case, your synovial membrane is going to get thicker and becomes tender. You get accumulation of synovial fluid. So you get fibrous tissue starting to invade the synovial membrane and also deteriorates the articular cartilage. And then the osseous tissue or bone becomes exposed and gets joined by the fibrous tissue. And it creates ossification of that joint. Okay, it becomes bony. Now in gouty arthritis, it's caused by some sort of metabolic disorder. You know, remember, metabolism has to do with chemical reactions in the body. You get an abnormal amount of uric acid released into the blood. And these sodium urate crystals start accumulating inside your joint. And these salt crystals are very irritating to the articular cartilage, as well as the synovial membrane, and causes swelling. Causes the tissues to deteriorate, causes pain. Okay. So it's very, very, very painful. Okay, so most people that I've known who've had it have said it's, it's excruciating. So. Okay, another important point. Just want you to know that synovial fluid is thick and viscous. Okay, it's not it's not watery. Okay, it's viscous. It's very thick. So, what is synovial fluid good for? Well, it's a good lubricant. So it reduces friction between those bones that are connecting to each other and articulating. It distributes nutrients. You can get nutrients as well as waste disposal for the chondrocytes in that articular cartilage. Remember, chondro is cartilage. Also helps absorb shock in these joints because they're being compressed whenever you walk or run or jump, or if you're doing other activities, if you're uh, elbow joints. All right, let's talk a little bit about accessory structures. So you might have heard of the lateral and medial meniscus, okay, uh, plural is menisci. It's just a pad of fibrocartilage cartilage between two opposing bones in a synovial joint, okay? Forms a pad. They also have fat pads. They also protect the articular surfaces. And they create basically a packing material for that joint. They also have other ligaments, you have accessory, extracapsular, intracapsular, capsular, some extras outside the capsule, intros inside the joint capsule. And obviously they provide support. And they prevent extreme movement. So you want, you want your joints to be able to move, but you don't want them to move more than they're supposed to, right? So you, your joints, are designed for you to have what's considered a normal range of motion. So you've probably all seen, you know, not maybe not all, but maybe some of you have seen images of you know football players and their knees go further than they're supposed to go, right? Usually there's damage to those ligaments. All right. Um, tendons. They can also limit range of motion, provide support. Remember, ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone, okay? But they can also limit the range of motion. Okay, 
And these accessory structures are kind of like the illnesses in the sense that they also make good matching. Okay, so it's important to know these. So the bursae, that's plural, bursa, singular. And these are small pockets that are filled with fluid inside the connective tissue. And they help to reduce friction and absorb shock. So sprains, that happens when you stretch a ligament. And some of the collagen fibers get torn, but otherwise your ligament's okay. Now, bursitis, anytime you see itis, there's an inflammation. It's inflammation of the bursa, causes pain. It can be caused by different things pressure, repetitive motion. Could be irritation by different chemicals, could be infection or trauma, I should say or. An example of bursitis is tennis elbow or golfer's shoulder. Then there's the bunion. It's the most common pressure related bursitis. And it forms over the base of your great toe, the hallux. This happens when the first metatarsophalangeal joint gets distorted. Okay. Obviously, your toes, your great toe is really important for walking and running. So having a bunion there would be painful. All right, another big statement where you have to probably, you'll have to finish the sentence. So the greater the range of motion at a joint, the weaker it becomes. Okay. So remember we said beginning, the very immovable joints were extremely strong and the joints that where they were freely movable were considered weaker, okay? And also, for those joints where there is a large range of motion, there's more potential for them to become injured. All right, another short answer to potential type question, factors that are responsible for limiting range of motion, stabilizing your joints and reducing chance of injury, okay? So collagen fibers and ligaments, can be that. The shapes of the articulating surfaces can help. Other bones, skeletal muscles, or fat pads, as well as tension. Okay, all these things can limit range of motion, they can stabilize joints, and they can reduce chances of injury. Okay. Turn. So dislocation. So dislocation is also known as a luxation. This happens when articulating surfaces get forced out of position. Okay. So it should make sense. So if anybody's ever dis dislocated a joint. You know, just locate the finger, shoulder, anything like that. Those articulating surfaces get forced out of position. Okay, possible movements. Okay, movements can be 
linear, angular, or rotational. So examples of linear motion, again, moving in a line, could be moving forward and backward, could be moving left and right, or could be gliding. For angular motion, these are movements that change the angle, okay, as the name suggests, between the object and the articular surface. An example of angular motion would be circumduction. Rotational motion, you're spinning the object around the longitudinal axis. Okay, it's rotating. All right, so axes of joints, it can be monoaxial, biaxial, or triaxial. If you move along one axis, it's monoaxial. If you move along two axes, it's biaxial. If you move along three axes, it's triaxial. Okay. We have gliding joints, surfaces move past each other. Okay, that's gliding, right? Okay, so before we get into the specific angular motion, let's take a break. We'll talk about the three different kinds of motion. Okay, so let's talk about that and talk about the different axes of joints. And you can do that at home if you're watching at home. So under angular motion, you have flexion, extension, hyperextension. So flexion is movement in the anterior to posterior plane, so front to back, forward and backward. And it reduces the angle between the articulating elements. So if my elbow joint, if I flex my bicep, again, that's flexion because I'm reducing the angle, right? It's reducing the angle. Okay, if I move my arm up this way or like this, all right, I am reducing the angle between my hand and my face, okay? Went from 180 to 90, flexion. Okay, my hip joint, I kick my leg up, okay? I'm reducing the angle between my foot and my face. Flexion of the hip joint. Now, if I take my foot, bring it up. I know everybody can't see me, but I bring my foot up like that, reducing the angle between the back of my foot and the back of my head. So that's also flexion. For extension, also moving in the anterior exterior plane or posterior plane. So it's increasing the angle between the articulating elements. So for then if I take my elbow joint and move my arm or hand down that I am extending my my elbow joint. Okay, if I have my leg up and then I move it back down, I'm extending my hip joint. Okay. My arm is up, move it down. I'm extending the shoulder joint. Now, for some joints, if you move past anatomical position, that is hyperextension. So with my arms, just coming back to anatomical position, it's extension. So if I move my arm back even further, it's hyperextension. And I move, if my leg is out and I move it back to anatomical position, that's extension. So if I move it back behind my body, it's hyperextension. And with my neck, if I move my neck forward, it's Flexion, move it back to anatomical position is extension. Moving my head back, it's hyperextension. So anytime you like go back with anything, it's hyperextension. If you go past the anatomical position. OK, 
his angular motion. We're going away from the longitudinal axis of the body. Abduction, so I take my arms and I do like the snow angel, move my arms out. That is abduction. Okay, same with the legs, moving the legs out, abduction. Now if we bring arms or legs back toward the body, that is adduction, okay? And if you move your arms in a loop, circumduction. Okay, circle. All right, you may have seen in gyms, hip abductor or adductor machines. That's what they're doing, working those muscles. All right, so for rotational movements, okay, if I move my head to the left or to the right, it's rotation. If you move a limb, it's going internal, so that's medial rotation. Out is lateral rotation. Now I'm talking about the arms here. I'm not really talking about my hands yet. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, if you move, this is natural anatomical position. If I roll my radius over this, the ulna by turning my hands down, that's pronation. If I re reverse the movement and return my radius back to anatomical position, that's supination. Okay, pronation, supination. And that's basically just, again, from forearm down to your hand. If you're talking about your shoulder joint, then you're talking about rotation of the limb. Okay, special movements. You turn your foot inward. Kind of hard to see, but if I turn my foot, and inversion, so turn it out, evert. Turn your foot inward, twist it inwards, inversion, outward, eversion. All right, with your ankle, you dig in your heel so your toes are facing up. It's dorsiflexion, so dig in your heel, dorsiflexion. D for dorsiflexion, D for digging your heel. Okay, it's the opposite. You stand your tiptoes, extend your ankle joint, elevate the sole of your foot. That's plantar flexion. Plantar flexion. If you stand your tiptoes. Okay, if you move part of your body anteriorly in the horizontal plane, you're protracting. You move your body posteriorly in the posterior plane, you're retracting. Okay, example of that is your jaw. You try to stick your jaw out. I don't know if you can see that with my mask, but stick your mandible out, protracting. And if you stick it back in toward your, your face, you're retracting. Okay, if you move a structure in the inferior direction toward the bottom of your body, depression, if you move the structure toward the superior direction, that's elevation. So again, with the mandible, if I move my mandible down, I've depressed it, and if I move my mandible back up, I have elevated it. All right, other movements, opposition. Some movement allows you to grasp things. 
Okay, it poses your fingers. Lateral flexion, if you move your vertebral column to one side, it's lateral flexion. Okay, because you're reducing the angle that you're moving laterally. Same with your neck. You can laterally flex your neck. All right, so let's take a pause and talk about the different types of movements. So talk with your partner about the different types of movements we just studied. Yes. It's just a fancy word for range of motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not really. I mean, that's typically the term we use, just range of motion. All right. So articular processes of vertebrae. Will form gliding joints with the adjacent vertebrae. So you get small movements in your vertebrae. Okay. okay these bodies are going to form what we call symphyseal joints. So they're separated and cushioned by the intervertebral disc. And these intervertebral discs have two main parts. On the inside, you have a nucleus pulposus. Okay, so it makes sense, the nucleus on the inside, right? And it's soft and elastic and it's like gelatin. On the outside, you have an annulus fibrosus. And as the name suggests, it's, it's tougher, it's fibrous. Okay. So why does that matter? So Anybody ever heard of a slip disc or herniated disc? So if you have a slip disc, that is a problem with the annulus fibrosus. Okay, it moves partly into the vertebral canal, okay, where it's not supposed to be. A herniated disc is when the nucleus pulposus protrudes into the vertebral canal. So they're, depending on which one you have, tells you what part of your intervertebral disc is damaged, okay? So how does the vertebral column get stabilized? Well, through the actions of several ligaments. So again, what are the movements in the vertebrae? All right, flexion. So if you move, you bend your vertebrae forward, it's flexion. And if you come back to anatomical positions, it's extension. Again, bending to one side, it's lateral flexion. Spinning around your longitudinal axis, okay, that is rotation. So if you're able to twist at your waist, that's more of rotational movement.
All right, so what are the major joints in your body? Well, you got your shoulder joint, your elbow joint, your hip joint, your knee joint, okay? These are major joints in your body. They're all synovial. All right, let me run, let's take a time to make sure our masks are both covering our nose and our mouth. Okay, so shoulder joint. You may also see the terms lenohumeral joint or scapulohumeral joint. It means the same thing. It's formed from the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus. Okay, it's a ball and socket joint. Glenoid cavity is your socket. Head of your humerus is the ball. Shoulder joint has the greatest range of motion of any joint in your body, okay? Hip joints have a fair amount of motion, but your shoulder joint actually has more. Again, it's a ball and socket joint. It's a diathrosis. Okay, it has some stabilizing ligaments to it, okay? And it's not the strongest and most stable joint but you get lots of mobility out of it, okay? So it's a trade-off. Okay, so shoulder joint problems. Again, these are good things to... All right, so we should be able to get out of this in 10 minutes, it should be good. All right, so shoulder separation. Okay, it's very common. You get either partial or complete disloca dislocation in the acromicroclavicular joint. So it basically has to do with the what we'll learn about in lab, the acromion of the uh, scapula in the, in the clavicle. Also, another injury is the rotator cuff. Okay. So you may have heard a lot of like pitchers, quarterbacks may have rotator cuff injuries, but sometimes golfers. Um, various muscles that support your shoulder joint sometimes get damaged and it limits the range of motion. Okay, let's talk about the elbow joint, also known as the olecranal joint. You get flexion and extension out of it. And it's a hinge diathrosis. Okay, it's a hinge joint. Capsule gets reinforced by strong ligaments. Hip joint, it's a ball and socket diathrosis like the shoulder joint. And it's formed by a union of the acetabulum, which forms the socket with the head of the femur, which is the ball. Permits falling movements. You can get flexion and extension, right? Flexion and extension. Okay, abduction and adduction. You get some circumduction, some rotation. It's stabilized by lots of different ligaments, considered very stable. It needs to be in order to pass weight from your body down to your femur, right? Okay, knee joint. It's a hinge joint. Where the condyles of your femur meet up with the superior condylar surfaces of the tibia. Okay, where the fibula or the femur meets the tibia. Okay, it's your knee joint. <coughs> Articulations here are complex. You can re resemble three separate joints, even though it's really just one joint. Okay. Knee joint transfers the weight of your body 
down from your femur down to the tibia. Okay, so it also has to be strong. The movements you get out of the knee joint, you get flexion, extension, and rotation. Just some rotation though. But obviously you can, at your knee joint, you can flex it, extend it. Okay. You have a little bit of rotation, not much. Obviously at your knee joint, you have lots of ligaments like your anterior cruciate ligament, medial cruciate ligament. So what are some different knee injuries? So a tear of the medial meniscus is a most common form. As you might guess, very painful. Obviously, it's going to restrict movement okay, at that joint. Okay. So, those are the major joints of the body. Okay. So, All right, so what I'd like for you to do now is to talk about those different joints and kind of what you've learned, because we talked about some things relating to these joints that we learned at the beginning of the chapter. So let's talk about those four major body joints. Okay, so. Now, at this point, I'm going to let you go ahead and work on your exit tickets. And I'm actually going to end the video.